you know me. You know me, I'm a man of focus. I'm John Wick, baby. But this girl, she's driving me crazy. She tells me to kill, you're never happy. I tell her, sweetheart, what are you saying to me right now? I'm not happy, of course I'm happy. She says, I can never be with a man like you. All you care about is money. And that's not true, of course it isn't. I'm just a product of my environment. She says, you gotta make your environment the product of you. I tell her, okay, little Miss Frank Costella, I've seen The Departed too. How you go about doing that? She says, smile. So I smile. She says, sing a little. I tell her, I don't sing, I sound like a frog. Then again, no one gives it to you. Not money, not happiness. Nothing's on the menu, it's all a la carte. You want it, you gotta take it. So that's what I'm doing. I'm taking it. Are you generally happy? And if so, what is it that makes you happy? And if you're not, what do you think would make you happy? If you're anything like me, you chase success in an effort to be happy. The continued progression towards some worthy ideal is your connection to happiness. But as a kid, I would play Pokemon, for instance, and the ideal that was in my mind was getting a Dragonite and a Tyranitar. In Pokemon Gold version, those were the pseudo-legendary Pokemon. Basically, the hardest Pokemon to level up to completion, and for that reason, also maybe the most badass Pokemon to have in the game. So I would have this ideal of having the perfect team lineup, and it'd be really hard to do. I'd be training this Dratini to become a Dragonair, and Dragonairs, they're not that strong, so they kind of like die all the time, so you're trying to like level up your Dragonair, but it's not freaking doing what it's supposed to be doing. Later on, you have the same problem with a Larvitar turning into a Pupitar. You gotta get both of those guys to level 55, and eventually turn them into their final forms. And so I would slave away at this game for hours, you know, like hundreds of hours, to get the perfect Pokemon lineup, to get all 16 badges, to beat Red at the top of Mount Silver. If you know, you know, you know, like this is the game we all played when we were kids. But every time I beat that game and I got that perfect Pokemon lineup, I would just feel sad. Like I would just walk around Goldenrod City being like, what is, there's nothing left to do. You know, that feeling of what next would overtake me. And as trivial as that example is, it has actually been relevant to me with every milestone. Maybe I've hit a certain number of subscribers on YouTube. Maybe I've booked the biggest client of my life. Maybe this girl with like a really great body like likes me, <laughs> whatever it might be. I thought it would be connected to my happiness, but really it kind of just makes me feel satisfied for a blip of time and then back to feeling neutral-ish, empty-ish on the inside. And so, more than a decade of groundbreaking research in the fields of positive psychology has proven in no uncertain terms that happiness really isn't that connected to the things that we achieve. For the ambitious among us, this is hard to believe, but like after your baseline needs are met, no amount of money or status can really give you happiness. Happiness is instead a skill. You know, leaving aside people with mental conditions and whatnot, for the majority of people, happiness is a skill and it actually is learnable. And in the last few weeks, I've resolved to get better at the skill of being happy. And in this video, I wanna cover some of my findings. So the first principle is this, track your flow state experiences and wins. Happiness is just four clicks per day. Essentially, one of the most reliable things, reliable disciplines you can cultivate in your life to be happy is to increase your number of flow state experiences. If you have come across Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's book, Flow, he talks about the optimal experience where you are immersed in an activity as being one of the most reliable ways to be happy. And when you're in this task, you like lose sense of time. You're just really connected to what you're doing and you're getting constant feedback. And so, so many of the things that we chase in life actually will realize that being in flow state experience is what leads to our happiness. This is why people often struggle to be happy on vacation, actually, or when they're relaxing, because comparatively, they actually find that they have more flow state experiences when they're working, when they're in some challenge and they're like working to solve it and their capacity is completely lined up with being able to solve that challenge. And in contrast, when they're in their time of leisure, maybe they are just like grabbing a beer with friends or you know, on their way to the movies or something, it's not really a flow state experience. There's actually a lot of waiting, a lot of downtime, a lot of mundaneness. 
And if your faculties are not being used in a way where you lose a sense of time, it's hard to be happy. So actually, this might be hard to believe, but studies have found that people are often happier at work than they are in their leisure time because their leisure times don't really contribute to flow state. And so in recent weeks, I've come up with this hack that has actually had a dramatic effect on how happy I am, which is to track my flow state experiences and to label each successful 50 to 90 minute chunk of a flow state experience as a click. Therefore, happiness is just four clicks per day. Flow state is defined by many attributes, but it's usually not a state of relaxation or passiveness. It's active. The best moments of your life usually occur when your mind is immersed in something difficult or worthwhile. Or to put it another way, flow state is like the opposite of boredom. It is interest. It is an optimal experience that we make happen. The most reliable way to have more consistent happiness is to track the number of flow state experiences you have. Recently, I watched this Guy Ritchie movie, The Covenant. And in that movie, American troops in Iraq keep using this term, a click. A click is used to describe distance. They would say like this base is 50 clicks away or this group of Taliban members are like 30 clicks away. Later on in the movie, one character basically saves another character by dragging him a certain number of clicks across a dangerous terrain. I'm being vague because I don't want to give away too much. But essentially leaving the theater, my first question was, what is a click? The answer is that it's just a kilometer. It's just a military term for kilometer. But me and my business partner kind of like relabeled this term. What if a click is just 50 to 90 minutes worth of usefulness? According to Andrew Huberman and Matthew Walker, a lot of our life works well in 90 minute increments. A deep work session, it's optimal to do it between 50 and 90 minutes. Our sleep cycles run in 90 minute tracks. So thinking about things in terms of like a 90 minute push is very useful for getting things done. And so I created this rule. What if I just created these 50 to 90 minute chunks of time where I'm in flow state? Now it's very hard to get into one of these states, but if happiness is literally being in flow state or having some kind of win associated with the flow state, what if I just log that better? And so I started doing this. And in the last two weeks, I've been keeping track of the number of clicks I've been completing. Some examples of this for me, if I meditate, that's a click. If I go for a 50 minute, or up to a 90 minute long run, that's a click. Because even if the run is just 50 minutes, lacing up, setting the intention, getting all my clothes on and you know, getting to the maybe my favorite trail, it all takes a little bit of time. So overall with the buffer, it does clock into one click, one 90 minute sprint. Running, lifting, any 90 minute period of success when it comes to uploading a YouTube video, whether it's writing a script, or doing a b-roll shoot or anything else and then the successful completion of any annoying but important task things like email laundry taxes getting groceries all of those would be considered one click additionally i would also say a flow state experience where you're with other people a relationship building activity counts as a click but it has to be intentional it has to be directed towards some kind of flow state this could be lunch movie night ice bath saunaing with other people events live performance cooking together i then log how many clicks i completed each day and every week and if i can hit an average of four clicks a day for a whole week i'll have kind of reconciled that over that week i was actually pretty happy a five click per day average would probably mean that i'm very happy that week indeed this is important because the mental construction in our minds of our activities is as important as the activity itself. It's what shapes our reality. So if you can log in your head and keep track of how many wins you have had, you know, a click, it's kind of a silly term, but I suppose it's as silly or serious as Pomodoro for tracking how well you're working. I find that keeping a good log of the number of useful wins I've had all week, it makes me happy because it makes me remember that, hey, I've been in flow state and it actually motivates me to structure my day around having more flow state experiences. So that's the first habit. You should keep a log of how many 50 to 90 minute chunks of flow state experiences you have each day and resolve to have something like four of those a day or maybe five of those a day. Now this is hard to do, but if you can work your way up into it where you maybe structure your day and your weeks well enough, so that you're trying to have as many wins in the day as possible and you're keeping track of those 50 to 90 minute chunks of flow state experience, it's actually a deep contributor to happiness. Principle two then is to always have something to look forward to. Invoke the Pygmalion effect. There was this great commercial by Campari. I'm someone who's like a deep lover of commercials actually. And in this commercial, the host of this great party is prepping the food, surveying the decorations, tending to the guests who are arriving at his venue while the narrator says, would there be pleasure without the glowing heat of excitement and anticipation? Isn't the best bit now before everything begins, where nothing is ruled out and anything could happen? I think this is deeply true. 
The anticipation of what is to come evokes deep feelings of happiness and enthusiasm. One of my favorite filmmakers, David Sandberg, he said the same thing about this. He said the most exciting time to be working on a project is actually pre-production, looking forward to the project at the very beginning because nothing is ruled out, anything is possible. And in the book, The Happiness Advantage, author Sean Aker points to a study that found that people who just thought about watching their favorite movie actually raised their endorphin levels by 27%. And I find this extremely powerful. You could go for literally anything, whether it's watching a movie or taking on a new season of your life. For every season, I like to have a focal point, and I would call that focal point this thing that I'm chasing that is absolutely achievable exhilaration. So what is achievable exhilaration? It's achieving a goal that is a 40% improvement from where you're currently at. Now, ideally, the clicks you complete help you move towards exhilaration. It's hard to plan for the events that will lead to a state of exhilaration, but what you should do is pick a goal that is 100% achievable and then make that goal important to you. Some things that have worked well for me is like focusing on health, fitness, like getting leaner, getting more muscular. It could be related to money, maybe increasing your monthly revenue rate, working on your personal brand, making content, improving your performance in the gym. If you're someone whose number one goals are around their social life, then it could be finding someone to date that you really connect with. Basically, you're trying to find that goal that is a 30 to 40% improvement on your life. It's your next strategic move. And have the clicks that you complete each day, those 50 to 90 minute long periods of flow state, have them connected to this state of achievable exhilaration that you're trying to achieve in two months or three months. The part two of this principle then is to invoke the Pygmalion effect on what you have defined as achievable exhilaration. This is one of the most well-known experiments in like all of psychology. Essentially, a group of researchers went into an elementary school and they basically labeled some students as extremely gifted. They would tell the teacher, hey, Sally, Sam, and like Sarah, they're very gifted. The data has identified them as academic superstars. They're the ones with the greatest potential for growth. And then they asked the teachers, hey, don't treat them any differently. Treat these students completely normally. Treat them the same as anyone else. And yet at the end of that semester, those students performed significantly better even though they were completely ordinary. They performed off the chart intellectual ability. Essentially the belief the teachers had in those students, it unwittingly and non-verbally was communicated. Those non-verbal messages were then digested into the students and the students could literally feel this expectation of greatness upon them and they rose up to it. And so this phenomenon became known as the Pygmalion effect, where our belief in another person's potential brings that potential to life. The truth is you can actually make this happen in yourself as well. It's the Pygmalion effect or the expectation effect. If you set an expectation or an assumption that some great result will come, and you pair it around that thing that you're anticipating, it makes you happy. And not only does it make you happy, it makes the likelihood of that being achieved like significantly greater. Now, what I found is that when you track the number of clicks you complete, when you track the number of flow state experiences you have related to your most important goals, it becomes very easy to believe in your goal. It becomes a lot easier to like think, oh, I can actually achieve this. Like this is gonna be amazing. I can actually put this whole thing together. And so these two principles become a very powerful habit combination in the first we're actually logging and trying to optimize for flow state experiences, what I call clicks. And in the second, we're making those clicks work towards some result that is fully achievable and yet still exhilarating. And then we also invoke the Pygmalion effect in it, where we almost create this self-belief in ourselves that, hey, yeah, I'm totally going to get this thing and it's exciting to work towards it. Now, this brings me to the third principle. Create useful protocols, especially around sleep and your morning. Sleep, unfortunately, is the foundational metric of happiness. There's been studies that show that if you don't get enough sleep, it actually increases depression and anxiety by 300 or 400%. Sleep is the most important metric to get locked down in your life, period. And yet you have to create your own protocols around your current like state of being conditioning to optimize for sleep. So some of the things that I do is I unwind by myself at 11.30 every night, at least by 11.30. I'm asleep by 12.30 and up by eight. And I track this on an aura ring. So I make sure that I have an aura ring score of at least above 80, like 90% of the time. And then I try to spend time in the sun every day. So as soon as I wake up, it's non-negotiable for me to get out the door as soon as possible and to take in sunlight, even in winter, to spend 30 or 40 minutes outside. And then throughout the day, I'll actually try to spend a total of three hours in the sun. I'll go for walks. I'll go running. I'll try to complete errands when the sun is still out. And then at night, I try to keep my screen time very minimal. So I actually have a very long log of things I try to do 
when it comes to my protocols around sleep. And actually, I have checklists and protocols around many different terrains of my life. And it is at this point that I want to make a quick pitch for my coaching program because so much of my success around YouTube is measured around protocols that I follow. I have checklists and protocols that I follow to ensure that my videos are at a certain quality bar and eventually allow for them to cross over 100,000 or 200,000 views and beyond. If you're new to the channel, maybe you wouldn't know this about me, but hopefully my long-term viewers can see this where there's a certain bar, a quality bar that I refuse to fall under and I try to maintain as much as possible. And it is something that allows me to reliably get great performance, or at least relatively very solid performance on the platform. And it's something that we teach inside my own YouTube mastermind. A number of students in my YouTube program, once they started applying their time and effort in the right things, like the metrics of YouTube that actually matter, they've gotten amazing results. A recent client of mine is John Sonmez from the channel Bulldog Mindset. In just three videos working with me, he's actually gotten his first video that crossed 100,000 views in seven days, I think maybe ever on his channel. And he makes such immensely high quality videos now. It's actually pretty astounding and amazing to see. But he has literally changed my life because I have a passion. I love creating YouTube videos now. It used to be something that I kind of dreaded doing because I just had to get it done as part of my business. But now I am excited. I wake up in the morning, 5.40 every morning and I'm, I'm ready to get to my desk and start working on my next script or working on my next video. And I love being a part of the creative process of, of creating these videos and most importantly, storytelling, right? If you want to be someone who is able to create an emotional, compelling story in video format, Nikhil is your guy. So if growing on YouTube is something that you're interested in and you wanna cross over to eventually 100,000 subscribers and beyond, and on top of that, build out a business backend where you monetize up to $5,000 per month. Some students have even crossed over into $10,000 per month off of YouTube. There's a link in the description box. You can apply for coaching with me. I'll be upfront. We are very selective about the people we let into the program. So some people have applied and basically not been let in, not been given a slot because we like to spend a lot of time with each person who joins the cohort. Like it's a deeply personalized experience and like we genuinely want to get people results. So it's a very curated selection of people, but it's been one of the most powerful and profound elements of my business just because it's such a community of growth and it's been amazing to see everyone's progress. The fourth daily habit then that you should integrate into your life for greater levels of happiness is building community. One of the longest running psychology studies of all time followed 268 men from their entrance into college in the late 1930s all the way to the present day. Essentially, there were 70 years of evidence in those studies that pointed to relationships being the single most powerful thing when it comes to happiness. Basically, in the midst of challenges and stress, some people who choose to hunker down and retreat within themselves, they're miserable. And then the others who call upon their friends and their peers to basically lean on, to have support from, not only are they significantly more happy, but they're actually primed to make it through challenging times way more readily. In the modern world, it is easier than ever to just be lonely. There's too many traps that keep us lonely. So essentially this fourth idea is all about avoiding those anti-happiness clicks that kill your sense of community. These are things like watching porn, scrolling Instagram, being tired, unnecessary driving, unnecessary meetings, messy environments. Just don't do things that kill your sense of community and instead work on building community. For me, the most profound things that I've done to build a greater sense of community is one, join an inspired location, join an organization, whether that be a gym, a co-working space, or even a coffee shop. It's crazy how many people come in and out of a coffee shop who could be like a great sense of community for you. And then secondly, schedule people into your life daily. I often talk about robot mode on this channel, robot mode being this thing where you force yourself to do things. One of the most powerful things that you need to definitely force yourself to do all the time is see people. Fucking go see people. Like don't stay at home all the time. Even if it feels more comfortable, you need to have social interactions all the time. And honestly, most of us are not doing this enough because it's so easy to get trapped on the infinite scroll of YouTube or Instagram instead of connecting with people face to face. But it is one of the most powerful things you can do for your happiness. And then the last idea I wanna share with you very quickly that I found was very fun and honestly immediately very rewarding is the idea of performing random acts of kindness for people. Commit 
conscious acts of kindness. I got this principle from the book The Happiness Advantage, and I found some very powerful studies in relation to it. Essentially, there's a long line of empirical research, including one study of over 2,000 people, and it showed that acts of altruism, maybe giving to friends or even to strangers, decreases stress and strongly contributes to enhanced mental health. Sonia Lubomirsky, a leading researcher, found that individuals told to complete five acts of kindness every day over the course of a day report feeling much happier than control groups and that the feeling lasts for several subsequent days after, even after the experiment was over. Now, in many ways, the idea of committing conscious acts of kindness is actually very related to flow state because it focuses our attention from outside of ourselves. We're not so like self-absorbed and instead we're thinking about the world, outward into the world. Conscious acts of kindness are actually connected to like flow state experience. Now, over this course of this last week, I've actually been trying to increase my number of conscious acts of kindness. It's been kind of tough to do, but this week so far, I gave my videographer a mic that I don't use that's really nice. I bought a Starbucks for the person behind me in the Starbucks drive-thru. The best one, honestly, was I gave a compliment to some lady. She held the door open for me, and then I just gave her a compliment as I was like walking inside this museum. And she walked back and she told me it made her day. She was like, that was the best that literally made my day. And then hearing her say that to me, honestly, it made me so much happier. It almost made my day. It made me think like this might be the most powerful habit you could bring into your life on a day-to-day -day basis for happiness. It's funny because so much of my life, I didn't even consciously think about happiness. I'm like, oh, happiness, who cares? There's not even any hope for happiness. We just need to go. We need to go do stuff. But actually I have elevated the happiness I have in my life over these last two weeks because I've been chasing more flow state experiences I've been connecting with my community more than ever. And especially because I've been trying to turn like the sense of altruism outward. And it's been really, really rewarding. Happiness is a skill. And while we are pursuing success, it's an amazing thing. Like I love chasing goals. I'll never let go of that. You should also cultivate this day-to-day -day satisfaction and chase this daily exhilaration because ultimately it is the most joyful way to live. If you're new to the channel, my name is Nikhil. This channel features video essays for creatives and entrepreneurs with a flourish of cinematography and a love for filmmaking. If that's something that appeals to you, then consider subscribing below. I upload one video every other Saturday morning. If you'd like to connect with me further, you can find me on Instagram where I put up the occasional post related to what I'm working on or what I'm thinking about. And lastly, there is a newsletter in the description box where I'll put out my bi-monthly musings on life and how to live it well. So if any of that intrigues you, the links are all there. If you want to grow on YouTube, eventually crossing over to 100,000 subscribers and making over $10,000 per month from the platform, there's a link in the description. Once again, you can apply for a slot with me for coaching. But with that being said, for those of us who integrate happiness, the skill of happiness into our lives, to us I say, greatness is coming. We'll see you soon.